Chapter 2 Small Tasks and Duties Wrapped in our nearest duty is the key, which shall unlock for us the heavenly gate. Unveiled, the heavenly vision he shall see, as pain and bliss, who cometh not too early or too late. Like the star that shines afar, without haste and without rest, let each man wheel with steady sway, round the task that rules the day, and do his best. Gotha As pain and bliss inevitably follow on wrong and right beginnings, so unhappiness and blessedness are inseparably bound up with small tasks and duties. Not that a duty has any power of itself to bestow happiness or the reverse. This is contained in the attitude of the mind which is assumed towards the duty and everything depends upon the way in which it is approached and done. Not only great happiness, but great power arises from doing little things unselfishly, wisely and perfectly, for life in its totality is made up of little things. Wisdom inheres in the common details of everyday existence, and when the parts are made perfect, the whole will be without blemish. Everything in the universe is made up of little things, and the perfection of the great is based upon the perfection of the small. If any detail of the universe were imperfect, the whole would be imperfect. If any particle were omitted, the aggregate would cease to be. Without a grain of dust, there could be no world, and the world is perfect because the grain of dust is perfect. Neglect of the small is confusion of the great. The snowflake is as perfect as the star, the dewdrop is as symmetrical as the planet, the microbe is not less mathematically proportioned than the man. By laying stone upon stone, plumbing and fitting each with perfect adjustment, the temple at last stands forth in all its architectural beauty. The small precedes the great. The small is not merely the apologetic attendant of the great. It is its master and informing genius. Vain men are ambitious to be great and look about to do some great thing, ignoring and despising the little tasks which call for immediate attention, and in doing in which there is no vain glory, regarding such trivialities as beneath the notice of great men. The fool lacks knowledge because he lacks humility, and inflated with the thought of self-importance, he aims at impossible things. The great man has become such by the scrupulous and unselfish attention which he has given to small duties. He has become wise and powerful by sacrificing ambition and pride in the doing of those necessary things which evoke no applause and promise no reward. He never sought greatness. He sought faithfulness, unselfishness, integrity, truth, and in finding these in the common round of small tasks and duties, he unconsciously ascended to the level of greatness. The great man knows the vast value that inheres in moments, words, greetings, meals, apparel, correspondence, rest, work, detached efforts, fleeting obligations, in the thousand and one little things which press upon him for attention, briefly in the common details of life. He sees everything as divinely apportioned, needing only the application of dispassionate thought and action on his part to render life blessed and perfect. He neglects nothing, does not hurry, seeks to escape nothing but error and folly, attends to every duty as it is presented to him, and does not postpone in regret. By giving himself unreservedly to his nearest duty, forgetting alike pleasure and pain, he attains to that combined childlike simplicity and unconscious power which is greatness. The advice of Confucius to his disciples, eat at your own table as you would at the table of a king, emphasizes the immeasurable importance of little things, as also does that aphorism of another great teacher, Buddha. If anything is to be done, let a man do it, let him attack it vigorously. To neglect small tasks, or to execute them in a perfunctory or slovenly manner, is a mark of weakness and folly. 
The giving of one's entire and unselfish attention to every duty in its proper place evolves, by a natural growth, higher and even higher combinations of duties, because it evolves power and develops talent, genius, goodness, character. A man ascends into greatness as naturally and unconsciously as the plant evolves into a flower, and in the same manner, by fitting, with unabated energy and diligence, every effort and detail in its proper place, thus harmonizing his life and character without friction or waste of power. Of the almost innumerable recipes for the development of willpower and concentration, which are now scattered abroad, one looks almost in vain for any wholesome hint applicable to vital experience. Breathings, postures, visualings, occult methods, are practices as delusive as they are artificial and remote from all that is real and essential in life, while the true path, the path of duty, of earnest and undivided application to one's daily task, along with alone willpower and concentration of thought, can be wholesomely and normally developed, remains unknown, untrodden, unexplored, even by the elect. All unnatural forcing and straining in order to gain power should be abandoned. There is no way from childhood to manhood but by growth, nor is there any other way from folly to wisdom, from ignorance to knowledge, from weakness to strength. A man must learn how to grow little by little and day after day by adding thought to thought, effort to effort, deed to deed. It is true the fakir gains some sort of power by his long persistence in postures and mortifications, but it is a power which is brought at a heavy price, and that price is an equal loss of strength in another direction. He is never a strong, useful character, but a mere fantastic specialist in some psychological trick. He is not a developed man, he is a maimed man. True willpower consists in overcoming the irritabilities, follies, rash impulses, and moral lapses which accompany the daily life of the individual, and which are apt to manifest themselves on every slight provocation, and in developing calmness, self-possession, and dispassionate action in the press and heat of worldly duties, and in the midst of the passionate and unbalanced throng. Anything short of this is not true power, and this can only be developed along the normal pathway of steady growth, in executing ever more and more masterfully, unselfishly, and perfectly the daily round of legitimate tasks and pressing obligations. The master is not he whose psychological accomplishments, rounded by mystery and wonder, leave him in unguarded moments the prey of irritability, of regret, of peevishness, or other petty folly or vice, but he whose mastery is manifested in fortitude, non-resentment, steadfastness, calmness, and infinite patience. The true master is master of himself. Anything other than this is not mastery, but delusion. The man who sets his whole mind on the doing of each task as it is presented, who puts into it energy and intelligence, shutting all else out from his mind, and striving to do that one thing, no matter how small, completely and perfectly, detaching himself from all reward in his task, that man will every day be acquiring greater command over his mind, and will, by ever ascending degrees, become at last a man of power, a master. Put yourself unreservedly into your present task, and so work, act, live, that you shall leave each task a finished piece of labor. This is the very true way to the acquisition of willpower, concentration of thought, and conservation of energy. Look not about for magical formulas, for strained and artificial methods. Every resource is already with you and within you. You have but to learn how wisely to apply yourself in that place which you now occupy. Until this is done, those other and higher places, which are waiting for you, cannot be taken possession of, cannot be reached. 
There is no way to strengthen wisdom but by acting strongly and wisely in the present moment, and each present moment reveals its task. The great man, the wise man, does small things greatly, regarding nothing as trivial that is necessary. The weak man, the foolish man, does small things carelessly and meaningly, hankering the while after some greater work for which, in his neglect and inability in small matters, he is ceaselessly advertising his incapacity. The man who least governs himself is always more ambitious to govern others and assume important responsibilities. Whoso neglects a thing which he suspects he ought to do because it seems too small a thing is deceiving himself. It is not too little, but too great for him that he doth it not. And just as the strong doing of small tasks leads to greater strength, so the doing of those tasks weakly leads to greater weakness. What a man is in his fractional duties, that he is in the aggregate of his character. Weakness is as great a source of suffering as sin, and there can be no true blessedness until some measure of strength of character is evolved. The weak man becomes strong by attaching value to little things and doing them accordingly. The strong man becomes weak by falling into looseness and neglect concerning small things, thereby forfeiting his simple wisdom and squandering his energy. Herein we see the beneficent operation of that law of growth, which is expressed in the little understood words. To him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Man instantly gains or loses by every thought he thinks, every word he says, every act he does, and every work to which he puts heart and hand. His character from moment to moment is a graduating quantity, to or from, which some measure of good is added or subtracted during every moment, and the gain or loss is involved, even to absoluteness, in each thought, word, and deed, as these follow each other in rapid sequence. He who masters the small becomes the rightful possessor of the great. He who is mastered by the small can achieve no superlative victory. Life is a kind of cooperative trust in which the whole is the nature of and dependent upon the unit. A successful business, a perfect machine, a glorious temple, or a beautiful character is evolved from the perfect adjustment of a multiplicity of parts. The foolish man thinks that little faults, little indulgences, little sins are of no consequence he persuades himself that so long as he does not commit flagrant immoralities, he is virtuous and even holy, but he is thereby deprived of virtue and holiness, and the world knows him accordingly. It does not reverence, adore, and love him. It passes him by. He is reckoned of no account. His influence is destroyed. The efforts of such a man to make the world virtuous his exhortions to his fellow men to abandon great vices, are empty of substance and barren of fruitage. The insignificance which he attaches to his small vices permeates his whole character and is the measure of his manhood. He is regarded as an insignificant man. The levity with which he commits his errors and publishes his weaknesses comes back to him in the form of neglect and loss of influence and respect. He is not sought after, for who will seek to be taught of folly? His work does not prosper, for who will lean up a reed? His words fall on deaf ears, for they are void of practice, wisdom, and experience, and who will go after an echo? The wise man, or he who is becoming wise, sees the danger which lurks in those common personal faults which men mostly commit thoughtlessly and with impunity. He also sees the salvation which inheres in the abandonment of those faults, as well as in the practice of virtuous thoughts and acts, which the majority disregard as unimportant, and in those quiet but momentous daily quests over self, which are hidden from others' eyes. He who regards his molest delinquencies as of the gravest nature becomes a saint. 
he sees the far-reaching influence, good or bad, which extends from his every thought and act, and how he himself is made or unmade by the soundness or unsoundness of those innumerable details of conduct which combine to form his character and life, and so he watches, guards, purifies, and protects himself little by little and step by step. As the ocean is composed of drops, the earth of grains, and the stars of points of light, so is life composed of thoughts and acts. Without these, life would not be. Every man's life, therefore, is what his apparently detached thoughts and acts make it. Their combination is himself. As the year consists of a given number of sequential moments, so a man's character and life consists of a given number of sequential thoughts and deeds, and the finished whole will bear the impress of the parts. All sorts of things and weather must be taken in together to make up a year and a sphere. Little kindnesses, generosities, and sacrifices make up a kind and generous character. Little renunciations, endurances, and victories over self make up a strong and noble character. The truly honest man is honest in the minutest details of his life. The noble man is noble in every little thing he says and does. It is a fatal delusion with men to think that life is detached from the momentary thought and act, and not to understand that the passing thought indeed is the foundation and substance of life. When this is fully understood, all things are seen as sacred, and every act becomes religious. Truth is wrapped up in infinitesimal details. Thoroughness is genius. Possessions vanish, and opinions change, and passions hold a fluctuating seat. But by the storms of circumstance unshaken, and subject neither to eclipse nor wane, duty exists. You do not live your life in the mass, you live it in the fragments, and from these the mass emerges. You can will to live each fragment nobly if you choose, and this being done, there can be no particles of baseness in the finished whole. The saying, take care of the pence, and the pounds will take care of themselves, is seen to be more than worldly wise when applied spiritually, for to take care of the present passing act, knowing that by doing the total sum and amount of life and character will be safely preserved, is to be divinely wise. Do not long to do great and laudable things. These will do themselves if you do your present task nobly. Do not chafe at the restrictions and limitations of your present duty, but be nobly unselfish in the doing of it, putting aside discontent, listlessness, and the foolish contemplation of great deeds which lie beyond you, and lo, already the greatness for which you sighed begins to appear. There is no weakness like peevishness. Aspire to the attainment of inward nobility, not outward glory and begin to attain it where you are now. The irksome and sting which you feel to be in your task are in your mind only. Alter your attitude of mind towards it, and at once the crooked path is made straight, the unhappiness is turned to joy. See that your every fleeting moment is strong, pure, and purposeful. Put earnestness and unselfishness into every passing task and duty, Make your every thought, word, and deed sweet and true, thus learning, by practice and experience, the inestimable value of the small things of life. You will gather, little by little, abundant and enduring blessedness. End of chapter 2